A big welcome and thank you to Google, and specifically to Alex, for supporting us with this program. Uh, we are joined in our audience today by education providers, our Technical Education Advisory Board, NCFE colleagues and IT departments from across our network, both internal and external. This is the first session in this program, and we've partnered with industry leaders from across the digital sector to bring you useful and informative content to support your own development and that of your students. To briefly come, uh, cover some of the housekeeping for today, as with all of our sessions, we have the question box over on the right. If you go ahead and ask any questions you have there, and we'll monitor that for them coming through. Of course, we'll do our best to cover everything today, but in the event that we're not able to, we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. This can include specific questions about today's topic or something that relates to a separate session. You've already received details about the additional sessions that Alex will be supporting us with, machine learning and robotics, both of which you'd be most welcome to join us for. We'll also have other sessions coming up on separate topics and we'll be releasing them shortly. With that said, it's so exciting to bring this together and I now I speak for everyone here when I say that I can't wait to see what you're going to share with us today. So let's get straight to it and I'll pass you over to Alex to get started. Um, so um, hello everyone, thanks for being here. I will be your host for today. So I'm Alexandre Rodriguez. I'm working um, as a Google Cloud Engineer. I will explain a bit later what is it and what's my uh, background. Um, but first, let me introduce you uh, the, um, the general topics we will discuss today. Um, so uh, we, we will start um, a bit um, a bit hard today with quantum computing introduction. Uh, you will see that I will try to be as basic as possible. You may have a lot of questions afterwards. I will do my best to answer them, but it will be a first introduction. And please don't let don't, don't let go uh, after the introduction because after that I will start to be a little bit more. I would say that practical around what's quantum computing, what we can do with it, and uh, what it can um, it can uh, do or help uh, for your uh, students' careers. Um, so, as you may already heard, I'm born and raised in France. Um, I studied uh, electronics at the high levels uh, equivalent uh, in uh, in UK, but it's called the BAC in France. Um, I've done five years of apprenticeship in IT systems and networks after going to HPC um, specialty, uh, mainly in uh, banking investment. Um, so working on simulation and making a lot of, lot of simulations um, with, with a few hundred of thousand cores. So uh, kind of a big deal on, on HPC. Um, I went then to IBM where I was, um, I would say that, introduced to the quantum concepts and I also um, had the chance to um, to work on the quantum campus and talk with uh, several uh, scientists there and now uh, since three years I'm working at uh, Google Cloud as a customer engineer which stands for uh, helping our customers understand our technologies and uh, use it use them uh, at their best. So I'm not a physicist, so um, um, I, I hope it will be as clear as possible and, uh, and I will be able to, to answer your questions, but um, be, be kind because some of them can, I, I may be not able to, to, to answer. Okay, so um, a first idea of what's the difference or at least how compute comp uh, quantum computers uh, compare with PC, uh, PCs or servers. They are not really uh, related. It's like comparing a horse with a hawk. Um, they, they are animals, right? They okay. They eat, they move, they sleep, etc. But it's very, very different way to move. A very, very different concept of animal and and kind of where they they, they go. Um, so first thing, as you may already aware, a general computer or classic computer work with uh, bits, so zero, one, only digital. Um, most PCs work at regular temperatures, right? We, we, we use them uh, during summer or during winter, and it's not a big deal. And uh, Moore's prediction, so Moore is, um, is the first CEO of uh, Intel, and he predicted that every uh, two years, every couple of years, uh, the compute power of uh, silicon chips will double. Which is right, but the, the problem is that for some uh, compute, it, it just can't stand with uh, with the amount of power re required. 
what we what we can talk before some simulation it's a few hundred millions of years to, to, to run them on regular supercomputers so it, it can't do everything um, so I go to the quantum computer uh, first first thing it's it works not with bits but with quantum bits uh, qubits, uh, qubits. Um, it's, uh, it will superpose uh, vectors uh, between, so um, as you can see, I don't know if you, if you do see my, okay, you can see my, uh, my mouse pointer. So uh, it, it will, uh, you, you will have a superposition of states of vectors. I will explain a bit later what, what, I'm, what I mean with that between the zero and the one, but it's not completely a zero or one. It's more um, a superposition of probabilities between zero and one. So I will I will try to explain and make it uh, as clear as possible. Um, one large difference as well with a regular computer, it requires really, really, really cold temperature, uh, mainly to um, to avoid most of errors that would happen at regular temperature. And also it requires superconductive materials which also uh, requires this very, really, really cold temperature. What I mean with really, really cold is like not far, uh, not, not far from the absolute zero. So it, it's really rare to find this kind of temperature in the universe, even between two, um, two universe, enfin, two, um, yeah, two universe, you, you, you will find um, warmer temperature, which is kind of crazy. And uh, one very interesting, um, um, hmm. one very interesting fact about uh, quantum computers is that every time you add an entangled qubit, uh, what is an entangled qubit? It means that um, oh, I, I'll go, I'll go there. I, I will explain later. It will be easier with a, with a schema. Um, every single time you add an entangled qubit you um, um, exponentially add compute power to your system, which make it very, very useful for very, very complex um, uh, computation. But at the same time, you don't uh, aim to, to run a graphical computer co computes or any other kind of um, compute, um, classic compute models on, uh, on the quantum computers. It doesn't work that, that way you will have a lot of errors. I will explain a bit more about that later. So it's not, it's not fitted for, for a classical computer, but really, really efficient on a very, very large and complex models. Okay, so let's go to logical representation. Um, as you may already seen uh, before, um, we, we, from, we, we tend to, to explain the way a computer works with logical gates. So you have uh, or, XOR, hand. So every time you, you send an input or two inputs or several inputs to a gate, it will do uh, a pattern. And then you, you will have um, um, an, an output after this, uh, this function has been applied. So for example, for a, a no or a end, uh, it will sum up the, the, two, uh, the two inputs. And the end will will tell you okay it's a one if it's two one at um, at the at the entrance it's a one also if it's two zero at the entrance but if it's a zero one or one zero then it's a zero so um, it will it will sum up and and make sure that okay both are the same status status at the entrance you can tell the same on the quantum side so the the right side of the of the screen. But it's really, really, really different um, because uh, first thing, you have this entanglement thing. So here you can see that we have a poly C0 uh, gates. Um, I would like to try to explain exactly what mathematically it, it, it stands for. But you will see that um, the, um, it's kind of hard to explain exactly what does a gate in quantum. And that's also the reason why uh, it's um, it's really difficult right now to find developers and people uh, really um, uh, with a lot of skills on quantum uh, on the quantum field. Um, but most of the time, they they will try you know to to do the same thing like an XOR or not 
uh, on the on the qubits, but in a different way because we we talk about um, other way to to compute, and it's not only a zero or one or only a value or a value between a zero and one. It's a superposition of values. But before going in the in the uh, hardest part, let let's go back a bit. What does a quantum computer look like? So you can see one of them. It's the Google quantum computer. Um, as you can see, it's quite large. So you, you can have a person um, near it, and you can see that it's larger than a person. Uh, first thing that you can see is the red enclosure. So it's, it's for ceiling reasons. It's because you have this really, really, really low temperature you need to get it very insulated. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, even if it's at very low temperature, the cooling capability of the, the system is really slow as well. Like if you go uh, beyond like, a few watts of, um, of um, heat, then you will see the temperature increase. So that's why it's really complex to, to maintain a, a cold temperature. And that's why you select which uh, devices, which um, probes, you will add to, to your computers at the very beginning and you will, uh, you, you will um, keep that way. So you have this ceiling chamber, right? It's open right now. That's why we can see the internal components. At the very middle of this, I, I will call that a mess, but it's not the, the, the correct term. Uh, there is the quantum ship. We will see later what it, what it looks like exactly and how it, does it work, uh, loosely. Um, around them, you have a lot, lot of, lot of red wires. It's a microwave instruments. Instead to send um, commands to the quantum chips and also uh, measure the output, the quantum state of, of our quantum chips. So at this particular place, the temperature is really, really, really slow. And every time you go uh, to the next layer, so up to the to, to the top, the temperature rates increase regularly. That's why you have this kind of um, layers that will just um, uh, make sure that the, the, the cold temperature stay at the at the bottom. All right. So now the hardest part. But after that, I promise you, it will be easier. Um, so we go to the um, subatomic world of quantum mechanics. First thing, um, as you may already see on my on my screen, we don't um, uh, we we don't show it as a as a regular uh, hall, um, the, the, as in a classical computer with a zero. Uh, so it's it's a, it's an empty hall, or one it's a full hall. Here it's the block sphere. So it's it's named after its discoverer. Discoverer. Um, Ish, what, what, what's interesting about this block sphere is that you, you will try you know, to understand the state of a qubit uh, system, so this quantum um, state, after reading the angles of your vectors. So what you will try is that in a, in a, in a single uh, layer of this, of this sphere between uh, on the Z um, axis, uh, between this zero uh, kind of absolute zero uh, quantum state and this one state, you will have one or multiple vectors. And after uh, computing, um, um, I'd say that um, a, a simple equation, so with your vector and and um, and a small um, up and a small coefficient. Uh, small or very inter a very important coefficient, I would say. Uh, then you are able to read this um, this quantum uh, this quantum bit. So um, interestingly, out of a quantum bit, you only uh, read a zero or a one. It doesn't uh, mean that between all the computation, the, the all the, during the whole computation time, it's an absolute zero or an absolute one. It's always um, a stack, um, um, a superposition of vectors, and their addition will give you this uh, or, um, this, this state 
is it really near zero? Is it really near one? And then with that, you are able to, to understand what you are looking at. Um, one really interesting fact uh, about uh, quantum is when you try to measure the change, the, 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 the quantum state, the, the qubit, you will see its uh, state collapse, so it changes. So looking at something will change its status. Um, if you're interested about this matter, um, it's the Dr. Schrodinger. Um, he, he, he explained it with a, with a really simple um, analogy. Um, you have a cat in a box. Uh, near this cat, there is some poison. And um, before you open this box, it's a black box. You don't know if, if the cat is uh, alive or not. And to know it, so, so during the, this whole time, it's it's really uncertain. So you can you can write this vector, okay? It's between alive or, uh, or or dead. And once you open it, it changes state. It's alive or it's uh, it's dead. Uh, but please don't do that with with your cat at home. Um, so it's it's really important to 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 to, to understand that uh, when you have a one qubit uh, system, you uh, you only can uh, get from that system. A zero or one. If you have integraled qubits, such as two qubits, then you can have uh, values between zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one, but nothing else. Which means that if you have large or very complex um, things to compute, you will need a very large system to uh, to host it and to compute it. So that's also. Oops, sorry. So that's also an interesting fact about uh, quantum computing. You, you can't have a small system to try uh, to tackle big problems. You need to have a, a proper sized quantum system to, to tackle those, uh, those, uh, those needs. All right. So the current challenge to democratize uh, qubit systems um, entanglement. OK, so um, maybe I can go back to this one, all right. So again, uh, with with bits, it's it's kind of easy to to entangle to 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 make bits work together with those uh, logic gates. Meaning that every time you try to sum up, you compare them, etc., you get an output. Okay, we are good to go. We can we can continue. On quantum computing, you you need to. Um, to, to make sure that those uh, two uh, quantum uh, quantum uh, bits works together. What I what I um, what I mean by working together is every single time a state change on one qubit, it has effects on the other one. So they completely work together. We don't know yet, or we are not able to explain exactly why, nor how. Uh, mainly because we don't know. And we don't see any um, any uh, magnetic fields or anything going to one uh, qubit to one other. Um, as of today, we we believe that if even if there are millions year light years between two qubits, uh, if they are entangled, they should still work completely together as a as a single system. So it's it's really strange. Uh, even Einstein told, told told that directly. Uh, meaning that it's it's really a weird uh, system, and that's why um, it's completely normal to not understand all the concepts around around quantum machines. Um, what's interesting is how we can get things practical, so people can start to get uh, to be aware of those systems and use them for their own um, own requirements. So if I can go back to this uh, to this slide, uh, entanglement is fragile, and it's really really something. Um, b before uh, the, the last few years, it was really hard to, to get a system stable um, for more time than a few hundred of uh, microseconds, which is quite quite quick. Uh, as of today, we are able to maintain them for a few minutes, but it's it's still very hard, and we uh, we have a lot of errors about reading those values and uh, calibrating calibrating the equipments which means that we, we don't run only one time, one uh, compute or one simulation. We have to read and run multiple times this, um, this, um, this algorithm to, uh, 
to make sure that we uh, we are able to to get uh, an error free error um, output so it's really really complicated very few specialists worldwide again uh, i'm myself i'm not a specialist um, only a tech enthusiast so it's really hard as of today for some some really advanced companies uh, have a few tens of person really expert on that field but even though it's really hard to, to, to get sufficient per people aware of the system, able to work on them, or even to write an, a program that can run uh, on, a, on a quantum machine. I will, uh, I will provide you at the end a few examples of programs that can work on those, uh, on those machines. And, and second and last thing uh, about, uh, about quantum, if you want or if someone wants to build a new quantum machine a new quantum ship it takes a lot of investment it's really really something uh, about cooling definitely research lab equipments it's a uh, hundred of thousand dollars of uh, of lab equipments everywhere to to be able to send those uh, those signals and read signals from the computer and so i'm not even talking about the the the, the, the materials and the and the system you have to build to get this thing working. But interestingly, you have a few frameworks that can help you simulate small quantum systems on classical computers. So you don't have the, the whole advantage, the whole acceleration factor from quantum systems. But even with silicon chips, you are able to get some interesting results and understand better the way uh, the, quantum, um, the quantum computer work. One framework uh, Google provide is called CIRC. You have also um, Q Sharp uh, from Microsoft, and you have uh, IBM uh, Q uh, SDK, if I, if I remember well, that does it as well. So if you want to test it and uh, yeah, have a view of how does a quantum computer work and how you can interact with them, it's definitely something you can you can do today. Um, so about um, about what we can do with a quantum system. Uh, the very first thing that you may have already heard is that uh, as of today, when we when we encrypt something, we do a lot of um, um, prime number uh, compute, and with large numbers. So I'm talking about uh, um, a few hundred of bytes or a few kilobits uh, key uh, to um, to encrypt uh, data. Uh, it's, it takes millions of years to a regular computer. To be able to crack that system, while the quantum uh, com computer can break it really easily if it has sufficient en entangled uh, qubits to support your uh, your um, your algorithm. So it makes um, today solution to encrypt things such as banking uh, transactions, such as access to any websites or any system really sensi sensible to those um, uh, quantum computers. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, today, the best quantum computers have, have a few uh, with, uh, with sufficient uh, error-free error, um, error -free, um, com compute power, have a few tens, 100 qubits. As of today, the best uh, keys, encryption keys, can have a few um, thousand uh, bits of um, of key encryption keys, so we, we we are still free of those problems, but we have to think of them right now to make sure that tomorrow's uh, quantum computers, when I say tomorrow, it's it's like a few years, a few tens of years, um, it it will be sufficiently um, uh, protected from from those systems. That's why we talk about post quantum crypt cryptography. I will provide the slides, so if you want to, um, to, to follow the links and, and learn more, uh, feel free. Um, some other things that it's really interesting about those quantum things is the quantum supremacy. Uh, I've talked a, a little bit before, but if you take a few millions of years to compute something or simulate something on uh, even the, the, the most powerful supercomputer on Earth, then you, you will not even try to, to start to, 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 to do this, uh, this simulation or this compute. So uh, the quantum supremacy is really a thing. I have a video at the end of the, of the, the presentation to explain a bit more what, 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 we, what we call a quantum supremacy. But, basi but basically, 
if it takes two, thousands of years or uh, millions of years to compute something on the best computer on Earth, and it takes a few minutes or a few seconds on um, on uh, on a quantum computer, then okay, we we, we have this quantum supremacy. Um, one very interesting fact as well is um, to be able to experiment new phase of matter. Uh, for example, you, you, you have heard about crystals such as a diamond or uh, any, um, any structure uh, 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 equivalent to, to, to crystals. The time crystal is really, really different uh, in, the, in the fact that um, they are, the structure, instead of being uh, fixed, is moving every single part of this time crystal, so every single molecule atom of it is moving having um, and interacting with other parts of the same crystal. And even though it's, it's a really large uh, system with many, many interaction, it's completely uh, stable. There is no entropy on it, which is kind of crazy because when you, when you try to, to add more and more um, things to, um, to one system and every single part is moving, and having some uh, interaction, some um, some gravitational interaction, for example, uh, with other parts, you will see that at some point it will gain entropy, and it will kind of crumble on itself. Um, you can look at the, the, the from, uh, at this problem the same way as it's the Earth has many many moons, like thousands of them, and and every single uh, one of them has sufficient um, has sufficient gravity to have effect on the Earth itself and also on the other moons. And even though, even with these thousands uh, of, of moons, the, the system is completely um, uh, stable. It, it can work for millions of years the same way without any uh, interruption, any new, new thing. So it's really complex to, to understand, but it's really interesting that we are able to simulate it and test it uh, using those um, those uh, quantum computers. Other fields uh, which are easier to understand are also, um, um, let's say that, um, almost possibly able to, to, to tackle with these quantum computers. First thing is chemistry interactions. So uh, as you can see on the, on the, on the right, uh, there is an energy production of molecular geometries um, on uh, on um, on yeah, on, it can be on on drugs or any uh, other uh, chemistry interactions, and so instead of using um, thousands of CPUs for thousands or millions of uh, hours, we are able to use uh, a quantum computer and make it make it compute this, this thing in a few uh, in a few hours. This one is really simple with only 10 qubits. And what will be interesting is that we will be able to uh, measure the same thing and being able to, uh, to understand and predict chemistry interactions. So for example, a drug on your organ organism, what will be the, the effects of it uh, with better uh, uh, quantum computers. There are also other uh, algorithms such as the, the Grover search algorithm. So think of it as an index on a library. Okay, I need a, a book where it is. Uh, with, uh, with a regular or classic computer, uh, you will try on every single uh, book. Is it my, my one? No? Okay, let's go to the next one, etc. Until you get to, 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 to the correct book. It can start, in fact, you, you can think of it as really slow, but with a regular computer, it, it, it's almost fast. But if you have hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of those books, it starts to be a really complex problem. And with a quantum computer, you are able in a few uh, hundred, in a few thousands of run to always find the correct book inst instead of having this distribution around half, um, half uh, request, um, half the, the amount of your books request to get the, 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 proper, uh, the proper book uh, place. So uh, you can tell me, all right, so I, I, we, we start to grab a bit the, the theory around it. How to get a bit more serious about quantum and how can I have my hands kind of dirty on, on, on those systems? Um, the first thing is that if you if you found off uh, logic boards, uh, then I would definitely uh, advise you to, to get to those to, to this um, to this address 
Um, there are some examples of uh, already built um, logic boards. This one is for the, the algorithm I just talked uh, a bit uh, about uh, before. So you are able to, to see those um, symbols, understand them every time you, uh, you, you have your, your mouse uh, around one of those symbols, it will try to explain it to you. And, um, and you have also a lot of videos and tutorials to, 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 to grab it and, and being able to, to at least understand the logic uh, be behind the, the quantum computer. So uh, let's rest a bit and let's get to, um, to some um, videos about quantum. The uh, tantalizing promise of quantum computers is that they can do certain tasks exponentially faster than classical machines. And the quantum supremacy experiment is proof that this is indeed the case. The word quantum computer is a little bit misleading because it sounds like a computer. And when people think of computer, they think of a phone or a laptop. The truth is the phone and the laptop and even a very powerful supercomputer all operate according to the same fundamental rules. And a quantum computer is fundamentally different. The classical bit stores information as a zero or one. And a quantum bit can be both a zero and one at the same time. If you have two quantum bits, then there are four possible states that you can put in superposition. With three qubits, it's eight, four qubits, it's 16, but grows exponentially. The nice thing about quantum supremacy is that this is a very well-defined engineering milestone. In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that experimental quantum computers can surpass the best supercomputers in the world. To actually demonstrate quantum supremacy, we have these three steps. First, pick a circuit. Second, run it on the quantum computer. Third, simulate what the quantum computer is doing on a classical computer. And we gradually increase the complexity of that circuit. At some point, it becomes completely impossible for the classical computer to keep up. Then we say we've achieved quantum supremacy. We started building together the quantum chips to do this experiment. And then the evolution of the devices with more and more qubits and more and more complexity is very much an iterative process. A lot of the work that we put in was not just these chips, but is also the infrastructure that you need to drive those chips. The cryostats that we install them in, all of the control electronics, software, all of this stuff is needed and it all has to be developed. When the experiment started, we were getting data from the experimentalists. We saw initially a beautiful straight line corresponding to our predictions. Then right before we hit supremacy, they dropped much faster and it fell below the threshold where it needed to be. And there's nothing we can do because we don't know how to analyze past that. So everyone's like, oh, we're screwed because it's just, it's getting really, really bad at large number of qubits. It's like, well, maybe there's some really complex interaction between all the qubits. It turned out that the reason was rather benign. We calibrated a little bit better and said that this is probably disappeared. So there wasn't like a, oh, we did it. I think we crossed it and then it wasn't clear that we crossed it. So we crossed it a little bit further. It took me like a day to realize like, hold on, you know, this is actually experimental data. <laughs> it's kind of amazing to see, you know, how well the theory works. The, the processor that achieved quantum supremacy is called the Sycamore processor. And it's parallel processing two to the 53 states, which is 10 million billion. And thus that enormous amount of parallel processing is what gives it the power. When we run a small chunks of the computation is the largest supercomputer in the world. Our estimate is that it will take thousands of years to complete the full computation. Technologies are born this way. Let's say the space age started with a satellite orbiting Earth and it was not doing much, it was just beeping. The big technical achievement of quantum supremacy was really dependent on all this young talent who's kind of taken this and gotten it to work at a very technologically capable level. We have reached a new computational capability. There are certain computations, the only place in the world where you can compute those things is here in our data center at Google Santa Barbara. 
the first time we're showing that we can solve a problem that is just infeasible to do on the biggest computers ever made by civilization. And what's exciting is now we're ready to turn this over to the world and say, let's figure out what we can do with this. The thing that excites me most is building a useful quantum computer. When we can give a researcher a tool that is unlike any other and say, great, figure out something cool to do with it. Mankind is pretty good at that. All right. Uh, I, I hope you're here well. Um, so, um, in, interesting facts about this uh, quantum supremacy demonstration is that every single step this, this team um, was trying to figure out, um, did we find what we, what we expected or are we uh, looking at something else? So it's really, um, um, I would say that um, a research field that, that still need a lot of more work before being, you know, practical, practical, uh, practical for many other other persons. But it, it's also an opportunity. So I don't know um, with your students if any of them are really fond of uh, algorithms, of um, mathematics, of maybe some quantum mechanics. But what will be very, really interesting is that in the next few years, it, I, I believe it will start to be a big thing. Uh, it, it's already started. Uh, you have a lot of uh, different governments that are um, spending billions of pounds to, to get systems work, to get schools, universities and, uh, and colleges, etc. able to, um, to teach and learn uh, quantum, quantum mechanics. Um, so I would really um, try at least for, for people that are really interested by uh, HPC, so high performance computing and a research field around uh, simulation and computer um, uh, and, and computer um, uh, used for simulation to talk a bit about quantum because in the next few years, five, ten years, it will start to be uh, more and more visible and more and more people will work on this on this interesting field and, and really um, critical for fields such as uh, healthcare, for uh, space discoveries, for uh, matter um, um, uh, simulation, test, understanding, and even understanding our, um, our environment. Um, it, it will be really, really critical. And, uh, and it will help solve problems that are that are old, uh, older than decades, like few few hundred, uh, few few tens, few hundreds uh, problems old. Even Einstein went to okay, we can try at least to understand and explain um, interaction, macro interaction uh, with uh, gravity, other things. We can explain. Um, things that happen at a really, really, really small scale, such as at the quantum uh, size, but we can't figure out what links them. And it, it can help uh, in, this, in this particular field as well. It will be really complex. It will take a lot of time again, but it will be really interesting. Okay, so let me go up. All right. Um, if it worked with, uh, with the video, uh, I may I may uh, play a, um, a smaller one like three minutes, and we will have around 10, 15 minutes for for questions. Um, so it's a visit of a Google um, Quantum uh, Campus with what's going on and what's the the devices you can find here. Uh, just let me check again on the chat. Okay, so if no one complains, I will I will play that video. Uh -huh. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Lucero. I'm pleased to have you here at the Quantum AI campus. I'm going to walk you around, show you a bit about not only the history of how we got here, show you a little bit more about the space and the lab and where we're headed. So I'd love to start with our Sycamore quantum processors. Behind this piece of metal right here. So, uh, just looking here, here on okay. the circuit board. 
Let's go all right. It's better there. There yeah, now. So it's the the processor. It's it's enclosed on a, on an aluminium case. Um, mainly, yeah, to, to 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 be able to move it and to um, to link it with the all the all the microwave uh, device probes, etc. Um, and it's one of the processors made by Google. So from the really ground, okay, what what kind of super su superconductive material we need to build down to, to build it up to okay how we can measure the the output the the results of our uh, computation behind this piece of metal right here on this circuit board and all these connectors that we have is the actual quantum processor this system gets mounted into our cryostat and that system we're going to see in full scale just a moment inside the lab so the cryostat is the real big uh, refrigerator you've seen a few minutes ago uh, so it's also a pleasure to have you here for all the reasons we can show some of the collaborations that we've had from our nine qubit systems that have now scaled up to say beyond 54. Here's a nice example of one of our systems that we had that was 22 qubits. And it's really cool because all these will be put together in the lab that you're about to see. So I'm gonna take you there, so come with me. Now I'm gonna show you where we take those Sycamore processors that I showed you earlier and install them into the cryostat. So we're gonna walk over to one of my favorite systems here. This little cryostat, is what we use to cool those systems down to really a couple orders of magnitude colder than space. Basically, each one of these metal stages that you see here, from this edge all the way down, kind of in this layer cake, the very bottom of that is what we call the mixing chamber. At that point there is where we mount the quantum processor, that sycamore system that I showed you earlier, and it thermalizes to that plate. That plate gets to 10 millikelvin. That's really cool. That's some of the coldest places in the universe. That's two orders of magnitude colder than like between two galaxies. All of that system runs all the way up the top where we have wires that come out. You can see over here on our control system, those are custom control electronics that our team, engineers here at Google have done and designed specifically to control the quantum processor inside. I like to think of them as a music player, playing music to the qubits. There's some analog pulses that come down and that musical score gets played through those wires all the way down to those qubits. There's a lot of different skill sets all over the world that these people are coming from to join the team and think about what is a quantum computer actually gonna serve everyone? And how do we do that responsibly for the world and make this uh, a tool for humanity? All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what this space is gonna look like as we scale in the future. Today, we are here right now at this point where we've just gotten past the Beyond Classical experiment. And we're headed towards these next milestones to build an error-corrected logical qubit. And finally, to an error-corrected quantum computer. Now, this space will grow, and we've really designed it to be the kind of place where we can land a number of these milestones along the way. Each one of these cryostats are systems that our team has spent many, many hours in design and customizations to make these some of the most powerful quantum computers in the world. We can do the impossible. And we look at quantum computing, it's something that we look at as maybe it's a 10-year investment, at the other end of that will be this tool for humanity. And I think it's an important part of that style of creativity that is not just a, a scientist's creativity or just an artist's actually kind of that combination of both that gives us the ability to be inventing the future. So it's been a pleasure to share with you all this space. I can't wait to show it to you in person and to see this place come together for an error corrected logical qubit. Until then, take care. See you all later. Okay, very good. Um, so as explained, it's the Google campus. There are several others, uh, such as at IBM, uh, one in Zurich, in uh, Switzerland. Um, it's really specific places with a lot of materials. Uh, some of those specialists I'll talk a, a bit uh, a bit before um, around those big problems. I, I don't think that um, it's the, 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 the really field, um, the, the, this research uh, field um, to, to, to be invested, at least from regular person. There are some, some place and, and more, more work to, to do. But I, I, would, I would believe that after five, 10 years again, we will start to see uh, new computers with less errors, less prone to, to, to errors, uh, with much more compute power. And we will see also um, other uh, simulation systems and other frameworks, software, software development kits 
to be able to use uh, the, the quantum systems. Again, not as a regular uh, computer, not as a classical computer, um, but much more to tackle those big problems I talked uh, a bit before. So thanks a lot for your um, attention. If you have any question, just let me know. If we go to Rachel, first of all, do we have any questions submitted by the chat? Hi, James. No, none so far. So if anybody does have any questions, please pop them into the question box. Fantastic. Um, I know we've got some questions submitted uh, ahead of time. Um, David's with us. David Seddon is our subject specialist for digital. Um, David, do you want to, I don't know how much time, we've only got a few minutes, so I don't think uh, we'll get through them all, but do you want to um, throw out some of those to Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the questions that came through before, I think you've already touched on some of them as you've been going through it, Alex. Um, one of them was, I, th I think you'd mentioned about the impact of quantum computing on the existing cryptographic systems we'll have. Uh, and somebody had said, Who, how soon do you think we need to prepare be prepared for quantum computing in breaking encryption and decrypting confidential data? Um, yes, absolutely. What's the, the question exactly? So uh, how, how soon do you see it that we start? I, th I think you mentioned that we need to start thinking about it now, but how soon do we need to be prepared for quantum computing to be able to start breaking current encryption and being able to decrypt uh, confidential data? Okay, really interesting question. Um, actually, it's it's really hard to um, to, to ta tackle that in a few minutes, but to to, to understand the, the 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 current main problems of of our encryption models, it's to to, to get at back at the basics. So uh, we use uh, key in encryption keys of a few hundred up to a few kilobytes size, um, with um, with an approach around prime numbers. So what what numbers uh, multiplied by what, by what numbers to get this uh, uh, prime number to be able to encrypt and decrypt the, 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 the data. And so the main problem is that once we uh, get to this um, big sized um, uh, quantum computer, we will start to see so a few hundred, few uh, kilo um, um, quantum, uh, quantum bits um, to, to be able to run efficiently for a few minutes, a few hours, we will see that those keys will be completely uh, useless because the systems are too fast to, 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 to get around. So I'm not able to precisely un, um, answer your question. Um, there are more and more materials about uh, the, the, the current state of research around this uh, quantum resistant uh, cryptographic um, uh, algorithm. I will try to summarize a few ones that are really interesting, and I will send it to to the um, to the presenters. So you you are you the organizer organizers, so uh, you are able to to dig a bit uh, uh, around that. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Alex. Um, one of the other questions was um, I know when we was watching that last video. It mentioned that uh, there's a lot of people with different skills coming in to bring you to uh, working in that computing space. Uh, what specialized skills do you think lends themselves well to particularly working in the quantum field? Hmm, really good question. Um, I would tend to think that HPC is a really great one because we 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 multiply the amount of computers working together to be able to tackle big problems. And that's exactly what a single uh, quantum computer does at its, um, at, the, at its size. So uh, I would tend to, to get that way, uh, computer simulation of complex systems. It can be earthquakes, it can be um, um, modelized um, for, for healthcare. For example, drug, um, a drug interaction with, uh, with, uh, with our, um, with our bodies, um, 
it, it can be uh, as well uh, on the banking field because interestingly, uh, they need a lot of simulations and it's also a field that, that will need a lot of compute power. Um, it can be also renewable, um, um, renewable energies because we need to understand better the interaction of materials and the way we, we can uh, create new, uh, new energy. Uh, it's also fusion reactor. It's also um, a big, big, big user of compute power, and it will definitely uh, need a lot of um, a lot of um, quantum machine when they will be uh, largely available and, and more uh, more uh, uh, more powerful. Um, it's also about space because if we uh, analyze a large system interaction. Uh, planets, um, stars, etc. Uh, same thing. We need a lot of compute power, and even things such as okay, where should I go with my um, with my spaceship to get the best speed uh, possible to get to that to this la last point? Um, questions such as okay, my Lagrange point. I, I can understand that, but how can I use it in a solar system and in larger systems? Uh, so all those fields will are already using and testing um, the, the quantum machines, and I would think that they will be the, the very first one to to start using largely uh, quantum machines. So students going to those fields will definitely um, at least be able to um, to scratch uh, one quantum machine at some point. That's great. Thank you. I think the, there's only one more because the others I think you've already touched on. Um, I know we can already use things like that. I know there's the IBM uh, quantum computing that you can log into and, and use it to, to try out quantum computing. How soon do you think it might be that we start to see quantum computing as a service? Or don't you think that'll ever become a thing? Uh, not at the moment. Um, interestingly, we, we have a quantum uh, service available on the, on the cloud side. But it's not based on the on the Google uh, processors. I, I'm not uh, in the secrets of the the person managing uh, the, this field. But I would tend to think that it will take. Uh, I don't know if it's a lot, but more years to, to to perform. We don't have the same business as IBM. IBM is trying to find ways uh, to to earn money fast, fin, at least the faster they can from those quantum machines on our side. We're trying to, um, to to understand and to um, to be able to use those quantum machines to build uh, an ecosystem around them before starting to build um, a business model. So it will take more years, but once we, we we can we can see that there are more than only potential, but much more person using a quantum machine not only to learn because we have all those simulation machines, we have a lot of ways to do so, but to use a quantum machine because there is no other possible way, then I would, I would say that we, we definitely uh, will release something. That's great, thanks. I think that's the last one, unless you've got anything, James. No, I think it's a great coverage. Um, I think if we've, if we've no more in the chat, just a quick check from Rachel. Hi, yes, I've got a couple of um, questions come through. Um, if you are using the normal computer to assess the data from the quantum computer, how do you measure the level it's processing it once, once it's surpassed what we're currently capable of processing? Um, I, I did not get completely your question. Can you please repeat? Yeah. So if you're using the normal computer to assess mm -hmm. data um, from the quantum computer, how do yes. we measure the level it's processing um, as once it's surpassed, what are the current capabilities of the processing? Okay. I, I think I got your, your question now. Um, so it's 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 really about the complexity of the um, of the algorithm, not 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 really about the the, the, the compute power, um, not not only about it because you're absolutely right. It's also about about that. Um, the the main problem is today we have small quantum machines 
Um, so uh, researchers uh, across the globe from Google and other research facilities built models that are um, really faster on quantum machine particularly, but are not really practical as of today. And as we can see, uh, from as, as they, they were able to experiment, uh, some models that are said to, to, to take a few hundred millions of years to, to run on the fastest, fastest supercomputer today are not able to run, um, are, are able to run in a few seconds, in a few tens of seconds on those quantum machines. What I can tell about um, the potential, um, I would say that gap between quantum machine and regular computers is that after 500 qubits, 500 uh, entangled qubits, um, it takes more atoms in the whole universe to, to only store the data uh, that is managed by these 500 uh, qubits than running on the on the, on the, on, the, on, the, on the quantum machine. So it's kind of hard to grab exactly that, that, that idea, but I would say that after a few hundreds of qubits, it, you, you can't read, at least from my perspective of it and what I read around that, it's not possible to build any potential system with silicon chips that could uh, pretend or compare with this uh, compute machine. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, we've got another one as well. Um, will quantum computers be good for the environment? Oh, use more power? <laughs> really great question. Like that. Oops, sorry about that. The cat. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, don't have cat in your house. Uh, so the. Um, the, 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 about the, the current, uh, from my current understanding about um, sustainability and quantum machine, it's not really, okay, let me do something about that and I will just get back in less than one minute. All right, let's hope it's finished. Um, so uh, about sustainability and, uh, and quantum systems, it's not really uh, the main focus as of today. I would think that the, the current uh, carbon um, footprint of a quantum machine is really, really, really bad because of those really cold temperatures, uh, rare um, uh, metals that are used to, to build them and the, the compute uh, power it takes to maintain all the systems to measure and interact with a, with a quantum machine. But at the same time, I do feel that uh, once we, we, can, um, we can have our experiment, um, I would say that um, mature quantum machines, it will be um, not that a big deal, um, mainly because uh, a quantum machine use very, very little uh, uh, power. Uh, it's, it's a few milliwatts, it's a few microvolts to run it. What takes a lot of power is this uh, cold temperature and at the same time, all the equipments around it to interact with it. But as of today, all those equipments are for lab purpose. So there are machines that are capable of many, many things, but are not specialized nor uh, through uh, an industrial process to make them really efficient at doing what they what they need to do with uh, with the quantum machine. So I would tend to say that it, it, at some point we will find some ways, but it will take time because of those cold temperatures and uh, all the research field that needs to, to focus on the, on the research part. And as as of today, not so much on okay. How my compute, how my quantum machine can be sustainable. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the um, at the at the Google, um, let's say that scale, uh, we we run on more than 100 uh, percent on um, on um, uh, renewable uh, energies. So uh, I would say that this system part of Google organization is not that bad for environment. 
but definitely if we start to build many of them uh, we will have some problems to get those uh, those cold temperatures etc but it's a great question thanks a lot thank you and that's all what's coming through at the moment um, apart from a few of the um, attendees are just asking um, is your cat okay <laughs> ah. Absolutely. <laughs> it was for the. Uh, I believe that if I would have, have opened the, um, the the window, they they, they would have uh, just quietly uh, get to to their side. But uh, yeah, in any way. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank <efficient>. you. <laughs> I think we were perhaps worried that you were performing uh, Schrodinger's experiment on your cat, Alex. <laughs> just closing the, um, the, the, the the curtain just just to make sure that they don't see each other so no no Fair everyone enough. is Good. safe no no problem at all we can we, we can assure the entire audience we can assure the entire audience that your cat is both okay and not okay at the same time that's that's the point right? <laughs> Really good one. Brilliant. Well, look, seriously, thank, thank you so much for today's session. Um, I think we're, we're, we're at time anyway. It, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's been a great walkthrough, um, really thorough. It's gone into some amazing depths, um, which I'm sure will be um, demonstrably helpful to, to everyone that's on the call and potential as, as additional resource that they can share with the students. Um, we'll go ahead and make the recording available to all of the registered attendees. Um, and I think I heard you say earlier, Alex, that you were happy to share the, the slide deck as well. So we can provide that to, to everyone that was registered as well. Yes, I will send, send it to you and uh, you can uh, share with, uh, with, uh, with the audience. Fantastic. Great stuff. Well, uh, just leaves me to say thank you once again, and um, we'll speak to you shortly in about one month um, to talk more about uh, machine learning, I believe. Yes. Brilliant. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. Great stuff. Thanks for everyone for joining today, and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye bye.